Uh, I'm Mimi Brin, and I would like to thank you very much for tuning into Facebook Live um, to hear my story. I'd like to take you today on a journey through the life of a man, Shlama Taporik. He was a Holocaust survivor who was targeted and brutalized because he was of the Jewish religion. Shlama was my dad. I'm going to start the journey today on September 2nd, 1943, in the killing center of Auschwitz-Birkenau in occupied Poland. Shlama gets off of a rail car. We commonly refer to these kinds of cars as cattle cars. And he's forced onto a line that is moving forward. And when he gets to the head of the line, he's standing in front of a German officer who asks him his name, Shlama Toporek, his age, 23, his occupation, Tanner. Shlama's wave to one side. Behind him is his younger brother, Herschel. And when Herschel is finished answering his questions, he's waved to the same side as Shlama. But there were other brothers and other sisters and mothers and fathers who got off of cattle cars who were waved to the opposite side. And those people were taken to the gas chambers where they were murdered. Was Shlama lucky? Yes, he got to live at least another day. Did he have hope? Yes, he could work. And after all, how much longer could this go on? Not long after this, Shlama is processed. And by that I mean, that all the hairs on his body were shaved off. He's given a pair of badly fitting striped pants, a badly fitting lightweight striped jacket, a striped hat, and on his left forearm, the number 145182 is tattooed. And he is told, this is who you are. You are 145182. This is what we will call you. And it is to this number that you will answer. Oh, but Shlama had a name and he had that name pretty much from the time he was born. In 1919, in the town of Lask in Poland. He had grandparents, he had a mother, he had a father, um, he had two sisters, and there were six Toporic brothers. This is Shlama, this is Herschel. Lask was a suburb of a big industrial city, Ludge. The Toporics had been in Lask since the 1800s and for a number of generations had owned and operated a tannery. A tannery is a place where the skins of animals are processed to make leather and the leather is sold to others who made the coats and the shoes and belts and such things. There were other tanneries in Lask. The Toporic Tannery was not a large one. And all of the brothers had to work in the tannery to help um, their father. Shlama started working in the tannery from the time he was about 10. So you ask yourself, what does a 10 year old do in a tannery? Well, you start out by dragging and then trying to carry the skins from one place to another. Was Shlama lucky? Yes, there were people that loved him and there were people that he loved. Did he have hope? Sure. 
He was a very hard worker. He liked the work and he assumed that he was going to be one of the next generation of toporic tanners. After all, how bad can things get? September 1, 1939, Nazis march into Lusk. Uh, they, I, I'm sorry, they march into uh, Poland and that is generally considered the beginning of World War II. In about a week, uh, German forces have come into Lask and the area around Lask and taken control. And the lives of the Jewish people in and around Lask are changed forever. Businesses are taken away. Jewish people are openly and often humiliated on the street. They are often hit or even beaten on the street, not just by the German occupiers, but sometimes by non-Jewish people who lived in and around Lask. All of the Jewish people are made to live in the same area, bounded by very specific streets. Everything is rationed and the food rations become less and less as time goes on. And then Jewish people are being taken away from Lask. Many of them are told they're being relocated. And in fact, many of those people were taken directly to the Helmno killing center, which was not far from Ludz, where they were murdered. Others are taken for work. Shlama was taken around the area of Lask um, where he um, smashed boulders and smashed large stones and was laying railroad tracks. And then he'd be brought back to Lask and then he'd be taken out again. Until late February or early March of 1942, when Schlama and Herschel are taken to the first of three Judenlagers, Jewish work camps. That was the last time that Shlama was in Lask. That was the last time that Shlama saw his parents. Now, these three Judenlagas were very, very similar. Um, this is um, this is Yavajno. Um, Sierra, do you want to go back? to the last photo, thank you. Um, these Judenlagas were very similar. The work was outside work, smashing boulders, smashing large stones, laying railroad tracks. The sanitary conditions in each one of these places was absolutely horrific, especially in the first Judenlage, Nekla, where the sanitary conditions were, were practically non-existent. There was no medical care in any of them. And while they were fed, it was barely enough to keep them alive, particularly because of the hard labor that they were required to do. It was from the third Judenlage that Schlamm and Herschel are taken to Auschwitz-Birkenau. Now, Auschwitz-Birkenau was a large, large complex. It extended for miles and miles in every direction, and it had a lot of subcamps. Um, and many of these subcamps were being operated by major companies who, of course, were making money. And also they were working for the German war effort. So you had companies like IG Farben, uh, Krupp, Siemens. They were into 
chemical manufacturing, pharmaceuticals, uh, steel works, uh, electrical components for um, U-boats and, and German airplanes. Schlamm and Herschel are taken to one of these sub camps, Yavarjno. Sierra, if you want to advance this. Um, Yavarjno was being operated by a big coal company. It operated a power plant there and it operated the coal mine there. The company employed non-Jewish people, but it needed a lot more labor, which it got from Auschwitz-Birkenau. Schlamm and Herschel work as coal miners in the coal mine. The coal mine was a damp, damp place. And the workers, all of them had a stand in cold water to work. The employed coal miners got equipment, uh, particularly boots. The prisoners got nothing. And the coal dust, it was every place. It got on everything. And it went right into Shlama's lungs with every breath he took. Was Shlama lucky? Yes. This was inside work. So if it was really cold or really hot, snowing or raining outside, it didn't so much affect him when he was in the coal mine. He worked the night shift. And that meant that there were fewer guards. Now, the guards were as cruel and brutal as any of them, any place in the Auschwitz-Birkenau complex. But there were fewer of them, which meant that there was always the possibility of one less hit, one less beating. And once in a while, there was some food left over from um, the employed coal miners. And once in a while, Shlama got the extra food. Did he have hope? Yes, he could work. And after all, how much longer can this go on? So we're going to move forward to the middle of January, 1945. Schlamm and Herschel are still in the coal mine in Yavarjno. Uh, but things have changed. Germany is starting to lose the war. Allied forces are surrounding the German forces. They're taking back lands that Germany and its collaborators controlled. And the Soviet army is moving closer and closer to the Auschwitz-Birkenau complex. The Nazis and the collaborators who are running the place are in a state of panic. They are burning buildings destroying documents and killing prisoners because they want to get rid of the evidence of the horrific crimes that were committed there. A decision is made. There were thousands of prisoners who could still walk. Those prisoners would be taken out of the Auschwitz-Birkenau complex and taken toward Germany. Most of this would be on forced marches. These were under guards. They were in harsh, harsh conditions. And we have come 
to know these as death marches because of the tens of thousands of prisoners who were murdered along the way. Schlamm and Herschel are taken out of, go back please, are taken out of Yevozno. It is the middle of January in Poland. It is cold, it is snowy. They are not given proper shoes for walking or boots. They are not given warm hats or gloves and certainly no Eddie Bauer coats or jackets. And they begin to walk until they get to another subcamp, Blechama. Blechama is in a state of chaos because the Soviet army is pretty close. And so Schlamm and Herschel are spending their time in Blechama, avoiding getting beaten, avoiding getting killed and looking for food. From Blechama, they continue the death march until they get to a large concentration camp, Gross Rosen. Sierra, you want to go to the next slide? Thank you. In Gross Rosen, Schlama is registered. This is his registration card. You can see up here the number that had been tattooed on his forearm in Auschwitz-Birkenau. And here you can see that he's given a new number. Was Shlama lucky? Yes. Because for the time that he is in Gross Rosen, he is able to avoid getting beaten, to avoid getting killed, and to always look for food. Did he have hope? Yes, because he knew Germany was losing the war. After all, how much longer can this go on? Sierra, you please advance. From Gross Rosen, Schlamm and Herschel continue the death march. This time it's a combination of walking and riding on open coal cars or in a cattle car until they get to a large concentration camp, Buchenwald. In Buchenwald, Schlamm is registered, this time under the number he received in Gross Rosen. But you know, things are different in Buchenwald. Schlama is there for maybe six weeks, but during that time, his feet have gotten frozen, he said. And every step that he took was so painful and he is really so much weaker so he's not so able anymore on his own to avoid the beatings and getting shot and looking for food. So he agrees to allow Herschel and another prisoner to kind of drag him to a like medical barrack. Now, there is no medicine. And maybe there was a doctor Maybe there wasn't a doctor. Um, Herschel is then taken out of Buchenwald to another camp. Schlama is placed on a cattle car. The cattle car was one of maybe 30 to 40 cars on this really long train with the destination of Dachau concentration camp in Germany. The train arrives there on April 28th, 1945. Schlama can't get off the train. 
he said his legs just didn't carry him and he didn't have an ounce of energy. Other people on the cattle car were able to get off and they pulled him off and they dragged him to a barrack where he was put on the floor. At which point he said, you know, after all these years of this brutality, is this the place that I'm going to die? Was Shlama lucky? He was. He was still alive. Did he have hope? Well, he had looked pretty far deep into himself to find it, but he did. He knew Germany was losing the war. And after all, how much longer could this go on? The next day, gunshots. The people in the barrack assumed that the Germans were coming through and just killing everybody. And it didn't happen. So those that could went to see what was going on and they reported, well, there are soldiers out there, but nobody recognized the uniforms. They're shooting, but it looks like most of it is up in the air and they're yelling, but nobody understood the language. Sierra, you want to advance, please? Then they heard Yiddish. Yiddish is a language that's hundreds of years old and sort of a combination of different languages. And it was something of a common language, mostly among Jewish people in Central and Eastern uh, Europe. It was, in fact, the language that Shlama spoke at home with his family, with his Jewish friends and neighbors. He spoke Polish in the public schools uh, and to the non-Jewish people uh, that he interacted with. In Yiddish, they hear, we are Americans, we are Jews, you are free. On April 29, 1945, the American army, go back Sierra, please. The American army liberated the Dachau concentration camp from the control of Germany. And on April 29, 1945, the American army saved my dad's life. So what did the Americans find in Dachau? Sierra, please. I was fortunate enough to speak with a GI from our area who had been a young soldier, one of the first to enter Dachau. And he said the same thing that I had read um, from the testimonies of other GIs who were the first to come in. These American soldiers could not comprehend what they saw. They found the dead bodies of thousands of human beings piled, heaped on all the empty spaces in this concentration camp, stacked and piled against the walls, the sides of every barrack. Sierra, please. They also found a train that had arrived the day before from Buchenwald. And on the train, they found bodies 
of human beings who had not lived to be able to get off the train at Dachau. Sierra, please. They also found survivors. Now, I cannot tell you that my dad looked like these five men. He said that his legs had not carried him for a long time and that he had not an ounce of energy. The Americans immediately called for more medical assistance and for food. They set up a medical barrack treating the most sick of the survivors. My dad said that he was uh, helped pretty much right away. And they also built a larger medical facility where my dad stayed until June 15, 1945, when he decided that he needed to see if anybody else in his family had survived. Sierra, please. And so he started going from one displaced persons camp, one DP camp to another. These were areas that were set up by many of the allies to house and to feed and to help survivors get back to life. Every DP camp that he came to, he registered and he put up a sign saying that he was alive. Did anybody know of anybody else? Along the way, he met a beautiful survivor who was alone, Rachel Schumann, and they get married. And they decide to stay in one of these DP camps, Kreuzen, in Germany. Sierra, please. And this is what Schlama discovers. Both of his sisters were murdered. His mother, his father were murdered. But miraculously, of the six Teporic brothers, five had survived, including Herschel. Sierra, please. While living in Kreuzen, Rachel and Schlama have their first child, Mirla. Now, if you see a resemblance between this gorgeous baby and me, you've got a great eye. That is me. Now, Rachel and Schlama knew that they did not want to stay in Europe. And with the help of a charitable organization, and there were a number of them um, that were in many of these DP camps. They were given the permission to immigrate to the United States. Sierra, please. On December 30, 1949, the three of us board the U.S transport ship, the General Heinzelman. And in two weeks, arrive in America. Neither of my parents had any fluency in English. And they had very, very, very little money. They got a little bit from a, a Jewish charity. They settle in Newark, New Jersey, and very quickly, my dad got a job in a factory. And in fact, it was a tannery. And while living in New Jersey, my dad worked in factories um, 
many times working two jobs at once. And it was while living in New Jersey that my younger sister, Helen, is born. Was my dad lucky? Yes. He survived. He actually started to build a life. He had brought life into the world. Did he have hope? Yes. He could work and he didn't have to be afraid to be Jewish. Sierra, please. Um, one of the brothers had come to Chicago, let my parents know that the economy was good in Chicago. Uh, particularly the construction industry was, was booming. Come to Chicago. You'll be a carpenter. You will always have work. And so the four of us came to Chicago. While in Chicago, 1955, my father, my mother, and I became naturalized citizens. Now, this is my dad's naturalization paper, the front of it. And you can see he's Sam. So when my parents came to the United States, they had decided that they were going to be Americans. Um, my dad said he wanted an American name. Toporic was fine. Um, but that Sam was the American version for him of Schlama. My mother decided that she would be Rachel, uh, would be Renee, the American version to her of Rachel. And they both decided that I would be Mimi. And so you will see that on the back of my dad's document, it shows that his name is changed from Schlama through these legal proceedings. My mother has the same type of notation on the back of her uh, naturalization paper, and I have the same notation on the back of mine. Sierra. My dad was so proud that he could raise his two children in a land where they themselves could make decisions as to how to live their lives and what they wanted to do for their life's work. And they didn't have to be afraid to be Jewish. Sierra. He was thrilled when he became a grandfather. I have two sons. My sister has three children. Sierra, please. And he was over the moon when he became a great grandfather. This is my oldest son with the first of his three children, my youngest, with the first of his three children, my dad. My dad lived to be 90 years old. Was my dad lucky? You bet. Did he have hope? Every day. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, would you be up for a couple questions? Sure, and thank you, Sierra, for working the PowerPoint for me. Thank you for bearing with me while I was going through the slides. Um, the first question I've got is, um, what was life like for your family when you came to the US? Um, you know, I was young. I was not quite two years old. Um, my dad, was always a very hard worker 
and he went to work right away. Um, I think uh, both my parents understood how lucky they were. He got work. They saved and saved and saved money. Um, they knew that I would learn the language faster than they would. And so despite the fact really that um, my parents spoke to me 99.9% .9 of the time in Yiddish throughout their life, the, the, their entire lives, they wanted me to speak only English to them because they really did want to learn English and to be part of America. Um, what was it like as a child of survivors? Um, you know, I, I knew always that my parents were survivors, that they had gone through horrible things uh, during the Holocaust, but it was what it was. And um, my dad spoke of his experiences, you know, a, a great deal. Uh, my mother, unfortunately, did not. Um, it was not something that, as a child, I, I wanted to bring up with her, thinking that there would always be time. At some point, she would feel herself. So she spoke of her life lovingly before the war and after the war, but nothing about her experiences during. And then my mother died when she was 60 years old. And so um, where we thought we had lots of time, we didn't. Um, and so I knew my parents uh, loved my sister and I. Um, they provided really, my dad was always such a hard worker and they really concentrated on my sister and I and um, it was what it was. They sound remarkable. Um, when, so you mentioned your father shared his story. When did you start sharing his story? I, I, I think that for me, my, my children knew my dad. Um, and he did speak to them. Of, of, of course, he had, you know, the tattoo from Auschwitz, the number. And so I, I think he said some things to them. Um, I can assure you that when my children see this, um, they will be learning really um, things that they had not known. So they knew generally, but the specifics now. And I started sharing some of my dad's story when I became a docent. And I've used that, you know, as a um, history of a real human being, which we need to understand um, throughout the tours. And then I put this together because the museum offered this speaker program for second and third generations. And I, and I took the opportunity to get documents um, through the US Holocaust Museum. They did tracing for me and really put together, listen to my dad's video and really put together in some form um, the story of those years. It's brilliant and great. Um, where, you mentioned you had family who was in Chicago already. Where did all of your uncles go? So I had uncles that um, went to Canada, um, uncles that stayed in the uh, um, New Jersey, New York area, and some that, that came to Chicago. Um, 
I, for right now, that's all the questions I'm seeing. So I will let you have the final say. And thank you. So, um, you know, the, the Holocaust was experienced firsthand by millions of people. Um, and a lot of them were common experiences, ghettos and camps and um, 24 hour a day, seven day a week fear. And yet every one of those experiences was unique because every single one of these people was different than the next. Everyone was different from the person standing or sitting or lying next to them. Um, so I am grateful for uh, this speaker program that the Illinois um, Holocaust Museum has because it gives a voice to survivors who tell their absolutely unique experience. And it allows second generation and third generation to tell the very unique stories of their families. Um, next week, the program continues. So on Wednesday, March 17, a second generation survivor, David Lowe, will be here at 10 o'clock um, telling his family story. So um, I know that the museum is grateful to everyone um, who joins in, um, clicks on to the different uh, social media that the museum has, and hopefully we'll start to come back to the museum um, for the wonderful exhibits. Um, these have been really extraordinary times. And so um, I, I know that the, great, uh, the museum is grateful for the support that the community has given it. And I would really like to thank you for spending your time listening to my dad's story. <laughs>